So I'm going to jump from the edge of the universe back to something more local uh, and search for uh, analogs in ZTF uh, to the so-called Boyajian, or some of you know it as Tabby Star. Um, now this is the sort of title we're using on our GitHub repo, but um, as Keaton Bell reminded me yesterday during lunch, uh, there's probably a, a better, more pithy title, which would be ZTF WTF, um, which I quite like, so maybe we should rename our repo this. Um, and this is because, if, if this joke is not immediately obvious to you, uh, here is the title of the discovery paper. Um, this was Voyagen et al., hence Voyagen Star. Um, a team effort from the Planet Hunters uh, Citizen Science Project, this is paper 10, Where's the Flux or WTF? That's the joke. Um, you were, ASCAP has a similar wide field program for media transients. I didn't know that, but it's not as cool as this. Um, I can say that with uh, absolute certainty because the Atlantic said this was the most mysterious star in the galaxy. Um, so, are so sure it's in our galaxy? Uh, we are. Ga Gaia we is are. perfect. Are yeah, that's right. Uh, so this has gotten quite a bit of press. So just a brief reminder of what Voyagen star or Tabby star um, is. Uh, oh, so it's quite famous. It's got lots of good press. It's truly famous because it has a Wikipedia page and its own Twitter account. Um, so you know this is an exciting object. Um, so a quick introduction for those who haven't been following along the Kepler stellar literature for the last uh, decade. Boyajian star is a seemingly normal F-type star. This means it's a little more massive, a little hotter than the sun. Here is a detailed artist's conception of what an F-type star looks like. They're, they're honestly fairly boring objects uh, for most stellar astrophysics. Um, they haven't been sort of the, the, the niche that planet hunters are usually looking at. Um, and this seemingly boring, isolated star uh, one day decided to go off the rails uh, and had this very strange uh, change in brightness as observed by the Kepler mission. So this is 30 minute cadence data taken over, uh, this, this, this little inset here is many weeks. Um, and Kepler being an exoplanet hunter, uh, we can imagine what kind of occulting object might have moved in front of this star and what the shape would have to be uh, to produce these strange like Batman symbol looking events. Now this was just one set of these strange dips. Here's the full light curve um, from the discovery paper. So this is four years of 30 minute cadence data from Kepler. You can see a couple, if you, if you squint, you can see a couple little events here in the first couple years that went unnoticed. Um, and then there was this massive dip. Uh, here is the blow up of this dip. 15, 18%, uh, uh, something like that dip. Uh, for a star more massive than the sun. So whatever this was, was a large or medium-sized but very opaque uh, something that moved in, a call to the star, and moved out over a series of a couple days. This, this central core here is about a day. Um, and it's very asymmetric, which is interesting. Very smooth. And then if you go uh, forward a few more years, right at the end of the mission, uh, a series of very strange dips. Again, this sort of bat symbol looking thing here, uh, a series of sort of Double peaked events, which people speculated might be similar. There's sort of like one hump and then two close humps. There's, there's a lot of hand waving and numerology going on when we look at this uh, light curve because we don't know what it is. Um, and there's been lots of speculation about what the source of these dips were. There's again, there's a couple other small little events here uh, that went largely unnoticed. Um, something like 8% of the four year Kepler light curve uh, was in one of these dipping phases and a couple of percent in total during these very deep dips. Um, the plot thickened after the Kepler mission when we went back and so you can see this is all normalized. Uh, this is a delta flux mission. When we went and renormalized the total light curve, it looks like um, from cal these are the calibration images. Uh, here we've stitched this light curve through a possible solution to these calibration light curves, uh, calibration images. You can see that the, there was a slow, um, decline of about 3% in the light curve over the course of the mission. Okay, it's a little less dramatic, but it's equally puzzling. What would cause this seemingly boring, isolated star to decline in brightness over four years, 3%? Um, once this was realized, a slew of publications and uh, popular science articles came out, uh, and continued monitoring uh, has been happening on the ground. So here's an example from uh, Tabby's follow-up paper in 2018. From ground-based monitoring, 
Okay, it's again, it's less dramatic, maybe less uh, enticing than the 15, 20% dips we saw in Kepler, but it's no less puzzling. One to two percent variations like this on an F-star are, are, are unexplainable uh, from standard stellar evolution models. There's nothing that this star should be doing that should cause it to vary like this um, uh, with repeated uh, durations. So lots of explanations have been posited. Uh, for example, the initial paper suggested maybe it was some family of large, very large comets. Um, so we've seen cometary activity in light curves like this before. They give you nice asymmetrical uh, ingress and egress because the comet might have a big cometary tail. Uh, and so you could see some large family of comets, maybe very large comets, uh, moving in front of the star. Um, that seems possible. Um, what could cause such large cometary activity? Maybe something like planets smashing into each other, something like Mars running into the Earth, or something like this could create a large enough cloud to obscure 20% of the light from this star briefly. Um, whatever it has to be, it's a big cloud of something, whatever it is. Um, this seems also possible. There have been uh, other recalibrations of long time scale ground based data. So this is, um, I think, largely ASAS data. So the error bars are large, even though it's a 12 magnitude star. Um, here's the calibration images from Kepler overlaid. Um, so it looks like maybe this 3% dip has sort of come back up, if you believe this data. Um, uh, and some other analysis of other ground-based data have shown similar, like, possible repetition um, of this dipping feature. So this, this long time scale uh, modulation might also be um, some large object or disk or something moving uh, in and out of our field of view. There was a very elegant um, visualization, I'm not sure if the model is super robust, but the visualization is very nice, um, where they suggested that maybe this primary big smooth dip was some kind of ring system um, that was slightly inclined and so when it moved in front of or transited the star, uh, you got some sort of like inclined, uh, almost like comet-like shape. Um, and the, these uh, funny little Batman symbols were the results of maybe Trojans that were in sort of proceeding and trailing uh, in the orbit. And if this model is correct, this makes some loose predictions about what the orbital period of this thing must be. Uh, and so they predict that in the early months of 2021, which is not quite yet, but is soon, uh, we should see this family return and we should see a large series of dips return. Uh, they said that this should be a secondary eclipse. It's possible, but it is weakly constrained. Uh, as far as I know, two years ago we did not see, because I didn't see a lot of Atlantic articles coming out again, so we didn't see um, the secondary eclipse, but that was a pretty weak constraint on this model. So potentially, facilities like ZTF and others um, in a year and a half, early months of 2021, can constrain this model. So Boyajian star has two, to, to summarize, has two mysterious behaviors. On short time scales, there are very unusual shaped dips, which probably are some kind of occulting rocks or dust or something. On long time scales, there are also slow changes to the brightness of the star, while a little less sexy, equally unexplainable. Um, and what we know from the, a little bit of color monitoring we have here, it looks kind of like dust is the best we've been able to say. We have a little bit of UV data, we have a little bit of infrared data, we have a lot of optical data, and it looks kind of like dust, because um, everything else looks like dust up there. Um, so the goal, like many of the projects we've talked about here, uh, we haven't done anything yet, but we've started working on this uh, for ZTF, WTF, um, is to use ZTF to look for other examples of this class. Now, Boyajian star at 11th magnitude is a little too bright to play this game with or to do continued monitoring really with ZTF. Uh, but there's a lot of sky out there. Not just the Kepler footprint, but there's a lot of sky that we could monitor. Um, so if you were to take a box of stars, uh, so this is the Gaia CMD of the Kepler data, for example. If you were to take a box, a small box of quote unquote similar stars and look for the incidence um, of this activity, uh, well, if you use Kepler as the most naive statistics, Kepler observes something like there's about 10,000 objects in that orange box as I drew it, um, and each with about four years of data. So if you just use very, very naive statistics, uh, and you say there's something like 50-ish million F stars in ZTF with appropriate light curves, um, ZTF has about 
twice as much data as Kepler, which is kind of funny. You have a thousand minutes or so on each target, but you have 50 million targets versus four years on 10-ish thousand. You get about twice as much coverage, assuming that this phenomenon is ubiquitous in F stars. It probably is not. Uh, that suggests that we should see several Voyage and star-like analogs in ZTF. Um, unfortunately, the light curves won't be as beautiful as in Kepler. Uh, we'll, instead of seeing well-resolved dips, we'll see one or two data points that are uh, abnormally low, 10 to 20 percent uh, dips. Again, if this phenomenon is ubiquitous. Um, and so that's an enticing number, right? We can put an upper limit on the occurrence rate of this phenomenon just by looking at all the F-stars that fall in this box uh, and going and mining all the light curves. So, the project that we've begun here uh, using tools like AXIS that we heard about yesterday, um, where we can easily cross-match Gaia and other data sets to select stars, uh, is to go through and do this wholesale mining of the light curves. I have no results because we just started it a couple weeks ago as a nice group project to introduce ourselves to AXIS and all the tool sets available. Um, but when we're looking for things that are in the WTF category, it's worth looking at one more headline that came out from Voyage and Star. Uh, as an example, and it was this suggestion that perhaps uh, astronomers have discovered aliens. That instead of comets, we're looking at some sort of uh, grand designed megastructure that's orbiting around the star. Something like a Dyson sphere, or a, a, pos a partially constructed <laughs> Dyson sphere, where they haven't filled in all the gaps yet. Um, different Dyson. So this opens the possibility that platforms like ZTF might actually be uh, good data sets to do SETI work with. And it, many of you in this room have heard me uh, make this pitch before, but I won't waste the opportunity to stand up here and make it again. Um, from a paper that I submitted a few months ago, uh, if you take really naive estimates about the so-called haystack that we might be looking for needles in. So this is the nine-dimensional haystack that uh, Jason Wright's group developed to parameterize the SETI parameter space in terms of volume and distance and time coverage and wavelength and frequency coverage that we're searching. If you plug in naive numbers for surveys like CRTS, or our friend ZTF, TESS, LSST, and ironically the every scope wins slightly, beats LSST slightly uh, because of the constant two minute exposures. Um, the point being here, this is in log scale, most radio targeted radio SETI work um, has haystack coverages of 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus 18. Something like uh, a pint glass or maybe a large bucket of water as compared to the ocean in volume differences. And here we are probing something like an Olympic swimming pool compared to the ocean. Okay, it's still a small sampling of possible parameter space, but if you're trying to infer the presence of life in the universe from a bucket versus a swimming pool, or if you needed to know that whales existed, you're unlikely to find a whale in your bucket. You could possibly find a whale in your swimming pool. So this suggests that ZTF might be an interesting or other uh, surveys like this could be useful platforms. Now, the literature is not well developed on what kind of SETI signals we're looking for. Uh, we're looking for things like lighthouses or runway landing strips or people waving flags in our direction, uh, but we don't have a lot of literature on what this might be. So one of the opportunities that missions like ZTF might have um, is developing how we look for these things. So looking for lighthouses could include off the top of my head, looking for repeating but non-periodic patterns. So here I've just drawn a cartoon of a Fibonacci sequence of pulses, things that are spaced out with progressively uh, larger and larger spaces. Uh, and of course, if you stick signals like this into data, you can also develop tools to go look for them. Um, so this last week I've been working on phase dispersion minimization for non-periodic but repeating patterns, which has been a cute uh, exercise. I'm not suggesting that aliens are out there blinking Fibonacci sequences at us. I'm just suggesting that we're developing the tools to look for supernova and other things that we can do database queries with and go look for signals like this. Um, another example would be uh, a project that I'm not leading but has been started uh, by a European team called VASCO or Vanishing uh, Something Something Century Observation. These are stars that either disappear or are very slowly changing on century timescales. Um, they have been looking at archival data, plate, uh, photographic plate data, and are trying to find stars that are disappearing or popping into existence, things that just should not exist. I will also note that uh, this team has reached out to me uh, with interest in using like ZTF force photometry to do validation of some of their uh, candidates. So this might be an interesting collaboration that we can tap into. There are lots of things in nature that do look like this. There's a long list that I just came up with. 
things like Voyagen star or uh, YSOs or R core bores can have very peculiar activity that we're going to find. But thankfully, they're also somewhat rare. So you can write nature papers or other cool things with them. So it's worth looking for very strange light curves. OK, and then with exactly 15 minutes under my belt, I will say my conclusions are ZTF is a good platform, and other surveys are good platforms to look for the WTFs of, of this world and of other worlds. We're on the hunt for Boyajan star analogs, things that hopefully look like this, but sampled once every few days. I think we should be mindful, just as a group, that in a year and a half, we might, with Voyager Star particularly, might be able to go back and make some stronger predictions about what it is. And I would encourage anybody who's interested in talking about SETI or taking this idea just a touch more seriously to come talk to me, say, tomorrow on the hack day. Uh, there is no working group in the ZTF or LSST community formally to do SETI, but there does seem to be a small but growing number of people who are taking this idea a little more seriously. So I would encourage you to come talk to me uh, or just send me a tweet. Thank you.